So Lord, we just come before you thankful that you visit us day in and day out, that you reach out to us, that you speak to us, that you are a living God. And so right now, Lord, I invite you to come in even more. Fill this place. Let this be your house, Lord, and not mine. And we ask, Lord, that you just fill my mouth with your words and that anything that I say fall on rocky ground and not bring it forth fruit, but your word land on the hearts and good soil and bring forth fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. So, this week I was kind of, I kind of go into this like, okay, Lord, what are you going to teach me today? What are you going to teach me this week? And it wasn't so much that he taught me something, is that he just revealed to me just some really deep, tough things. And so, like he said, we were writing songs, and this this sermon kind of just led me to that. And so, you know, I'll call it the day before, okay? So we're going to look at the day before the cross. Because so, in my life and in my experience, we have exalted the day Jesus died. The cross is the culmination of everything. But if you think about it, without the day before, without what happened to Jesus the day before, the cross wouldn't have happened. And so there's a lot of choices and a lot of things Jesus did the day before that really just interested me and grabbed my attention. So if you, you know, we're going to be in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but mostly John. But if you look, if you take a step back, when you open up the Gospels, so you can just start at Matthew, and if you go to those sections where it's talking about more or less the day before, so it's like Matthew 26, and that's basically it. Because in chapter 27, it's the morning. So you're just looking at kind of, well, you you know, you look at the headlines. Jesus celebrates the Passover with his disciples. He institutes the Lord's Supper, prayer in the garden, predicts Peter's denial. But then he goes and he's betrayed and arrested in Gethsemane. If you go to Mark, in Mark, it's the same thing. There's not much. It's just the Lord talk or just those same different headlines in a different book. Luke goes into a little bit more interesting things where he talks about, uh, let's see, here we are. So in Luke 22, you know, instituting the Lord's Supper, and then he talks about an argument about who's greater that the disciples have. So you're getting a little bit more intimate into what happened at this Lord's, at this Last Supper. But then we go to John. And you go to John 13. And from 13 to chapter 18 is what Jesus says. So John focuses on what Jesus says at the Last Supper. And so if you think about it, Jesus knows. Jesus has been predicting his death throughout the gospel Throughout his three years, he has been predicting his death and saying, guys, I'm going to die. Guys, I'm going to die. I'm going to come back, but I'm going to die. And here we are, the day before Jesus dies, and these are the last words he really speaks to all of his friends in a group. So I was like, so as I'm like withdrawing myself and just kind of looking at that overview between and the comparisons between each of the Gospels, I go, don't you think I should probably focus and look at what Jesus says the day before he dies? You know, we all go, oh, what what are, you know, what, I hope my last words are really profound. But this guy knew that he was going to die. And so what does he say to his closest friends, the ones that are going to carry the torch that he's been teaching them? 
And so I'm just, I was like, I'm reading it. And, and at 13, verse 18, he identifies his betrayer. He identifies Judas Iscariot. Says, I'm going to give him, he who I give him a piece of bread, he's going to come against me. In verse 26, Jesus answered, It is he whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. Then Jesus said to him, What you do, do quickly. But no one at the table knew for what reason he had said to him. For they thought, because Judas had the mudding box, that Jesus said to him, Buy those things we need for the feast. But he, but, which is incredible that it doesn't click in their heads because in verse 21, when Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. In 22, then the disciples looked at one another perplexed about whom he spoke. Then Jesus says, or then leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, that's Simon Peter, Lord, who is it? Jesus tells him, then gives the bread, and Simon Peter literally heard the words and doesn't raise a stink. Like, oh my gosh, this dude's going to be betray our master. So it's like, are you clueless? And to be honest, most of us are. We hear the Lord's words, yet sometimes we don't react. We don't react the way we should. And then Jesus gives a new commandment. Now the Son of Man, in verse 13, verse 31. So when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all we know, by this all will know, that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And then Simon Peter which Peter is one of my favorites because he's always the one being shown as the screw up and how Jesus continues to love and accept him. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? At Peter, as if I haven't been telling you for the last three years of my ministry, where I'm going. He says, where am I going? You, where I am going, you cannot follow me, but you shall follow me afterward. And then he predicts Jesus, uh, Peter's denial of him. And then so now as we get into this, we're getting into more intimate conversations in verses in chapter 14 and on of what kind of went on around that Passover table. You know, John doesn't really f mention a whole lot of parables that Jesus spoke at the 5,000 on the Mount Sinai and all those other ones. That's more Matthew and Mark. But right here, he gets so intimate into this. You know, like when you were with your closest friends and you know that tomorrow you die, wouldn't you want to make it so special? Wouldn't you try your hardest to convey just how much you love them, the, the best things that they've done for you, you know, the 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 biggest news that you want them to share or hold with them. And so here we are, we're getting that intimate look that this is the day before Jesus dies. And so he says, you know, let your heart not be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and I go and prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may also be. And where I go, you know, and the way, you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, 
I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In chapter 14, verse 7, If you had known me, you would have known my Father also, and from now on you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, it is, and it is sufficient for us. And Jesus said to him, Philip, where have you been? Where have you been? It's been three years that you've been walking with me. He says, have you been with, have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. So he's saying, if you don't even believe me that I am telling you this, that I am in the Father, that if you see me, you see the Father. He's saying, even if you don't believe me, believe the works. You've been with me for three years. You have seen so many things. And if you go to the end of John real quick, you don't have to go to, but I'll, I'll pull it up. And he says, and in John 21, 25. And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. So you're getting a tiny, tiny taste of what Jesus, the works that Jesus did. Philip, you were with me three years. Come on, man. Three years. And all the books in the world couldn't contain the miracles that Jesus did. And you're asking me, show us the Father. It's like one of those moments where you just want to like smack him upside the head. This is, so 14 verse 12 is kind of one of my exciting and favorite promises. And I kind of go back to this and lean on this time and time again that Jesus in this most intimate time says to his men, most assuredly I say to you, who he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. That the father may be glorified in the son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. I've been to this, this verse before and because I was researching, you know, when we pray and I say, in Jesus' name, I was just analyzing and like, Lord, am I, am I, is that a religious kind of saying? Am I just religiously wrote saying this at the end of the prayer, you know, or is there an actual purpose? And he led me to this verse and I said, ooh, that puts that in Jesus' name, that last phrase into a whole new light and into a stronger light so when I finish with in Jesus name I am asking for it and he promises that anything I ask will come about Jesus didn't say some things he didn't say I'll pick and choose he said anything but if you're using it and praying it in Jesus' name, and if you're praying with the will of the Father and the belief in Jesus, then it's going to be attributed. And it's going to be for their glory, for the Father's glory. And, and if you haven't picked up on it yet, he is, Jesus is glorifying the Father above himself. He doesn't say me and the Father. He says the Father in me. I don't do the works. It's the Father working through me. And then here's another promise that I'm, I'm excited that he, he said to him, but, you know, obviously it's, we're looking back. He says in verse four, chapter 14, verse 18, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. 
I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. You know, it's along with the promises, I shall never leave you nor forsake you even to the end of this age. Here's another promise. I will not leave you an orphan. You know, it's one thing to be forsaken and to be lonely, but it's a whole another thing to be fatherless, to be parentless, to have no parents. I don't, I still have my parents, but I can only imagine that to be in the world without a parent, you know, whether or not you always agree with them or you always love on them, they do have knowledge and experience that that that's a place that we'd want to draw from. But he's promising you that you will always have a place to draw from, a person to always draw from, strength to draw from, love to draw from, knowledge and wisdom to draw from. He's promising that. So it's even more than just, just being never forsaken or forgotten as like a friend wouldn't leave you. This is a parent saying, I will never leave you. I'm not leaving you. So it's a more intimate thing. A friend can love you, but they can't love you like a parent loves you. Like a mother and a father love you. They can't love you like that. Because it's a different relationship. The, the, the growth in that relationship has been, is a foundation of that. And then he says in verse 19, 14, 19, a little while longer and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I, would, I live. You will also live. You will live also. At that day you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me and he who loves me will be loved by my Father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. So do you understand that the world who doesn't believe Jesus is the son of God, he's gone from them. He's dead. The physical body of Jesus Christ is dead to the world. But we see the physical manifestation of Jesus because we are in him. He is in us. The father is in all of us. And here's another one. These things that I have spoken, verse 25, these things I have spoken to you while being present with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, okay, so here's the hierarchy, Father, Son, and the Helper, the Holy Spirit, goes in the name of Jesus. He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I have said to you. So that's a promise to all of us, right? You know, in my mind, I was always like, ah, I'm not a good Christian if I don't memorize these Bible verses or if I don't know. But here's the promise right here. He will bring to remembrance, the helper will bring to remembrance all things that he has said to us. And so we can trust in that. There's a, that's a promise we can call on him and say, Lord, I need your help. And he probably by the time, before you've even finished saying it, He's already brought it to memory and you're like, oh. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You have heard me say to you, I am going away and coming back to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said, I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, right? The day before, I will not be able to talk much with you. For the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me, but that the world may know that I love the Father and as the Father gave me commandment, so I do. Arise, let us go from here. So there was something... As I was flipping through the Bible, just searching for, okay, Lord, what do you want to speak to me? He brought me to Hebrews 6, which talks about like the unforgivable sin. And so the unforgivable sin is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. So Hebrews 6, 1 
through a couple of those verses is almost like a greater explanation of it. And that there's no hope for those that have tasted, experienced it to come back. And so here it says in, verse, in chapter 15 of John, verse 2, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every ba- branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. To borrow a phrase from the Marine Corps, God didn't promise you a rose garden. So where in our minds, in our lazy minds, have we thought that, oh, this walk is going to be easy? I know I have been guilty of that for many, many times. Why, are, why am I experiencing this? I shouldn't. I love you, God. You must hate me if you're making me lose my job for a year and a half. And the fact of the matter is, he loves me so much, he let me lose my job for a year and a half. Because my faith grew in that year and a half more than it ever would have. I had to trust in the Lord to provide for me. I have a mortgage payment. I was making half of my mortgage payment in a month. And that was it. And I still had car payments, car insurance, food, electricity, water, all that. I had all those bills to pay. For a year and a half, and I lost nothing on $700. Of that I will always testify. And so he says in 15.5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. I believe that's similar to Hebrews 6. But do you, are you understanding, are you hearing what he keeps saying? If you abide in me, I will abide in you. It's a symbiotic relationship. It's not a one-way street. You abide in him, he abides in you. He can't abide in you if you aren't abiding in him. And then this is one of these important points here that I, I, he kind of just, he throws out there to his guys as he's sitting there at the dinner table. They're eating, they're drinking, and they're, and they're just celebrating the Passover, not even realizing that, oh, tomorrow comes the day. Jesus does. But he says in verse, chapter 15, verse 13, Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. He's saying, I'm going to do this for you guys. I have no more love to offer you than to die for you and your sins. So are we, are we getting it? These are tough things that he is talking to his friends about, intimate things. He's telling them, I'm going to die but I love you so much that I am going to die for you. But here's this thing that in verse 18, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So why do we struggle so much to be liked by this world? Jesus didn't struggle with that at all. He didn't struggle with, oh, man, darn it, Peter. I really wish those Pharisees liked me and we could all get along. If you are abiding in him and he is in you, they're not going to like you. Because you know what? Sin doesn't like to be found out. And the light of the world reveals sin. He says it in here. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hate both me and my Father. But this happened that the word might be fulfilled, which is written in their law. They hated me without cause. In chapter 16, verse 1. These things I have spoken to you, that you should not be made to stumble. So he's telling them, he's giving them warning. Guys, these things are coming. These things are coming. And I believe that the Lord won't let us be blindsided. 
He's given us hints and signs whether or not we're just too blind, Philip, to recognize and hear the words that he's been saying to us before it happens. Or are we even asking those questions to make sure that we're not caught unawares? Do we even realize that we can ask those questions? They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God's service. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things I have told you that when the time comes, you may remember that I told them to you. Told you of them. He keeps saying that. I'm telling you these things so that you will remember that when I told you these things, when it comes about. And so then in, in section, in chapter 16, verse 5, he talks about sending the helper again. This is a, a, the continuation of, I am going to send you someone. I am going to send you someone, someone a part of me in my name that is going to help lead you, that is going to love you, that is going to guide you, that is going to bring remembrance of the things that I have said. But here's the side effect. He convicts you of the sin. He convicts you of the wrong. But he will glorify me, verse 14, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. So all things that the Father flows into Christ, and therefore I said he will take of mine and declare it to you, flows into the Holy Spirit. But here, and then in 16, verse 23, And in that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give to you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will, be, you will receive, that your joy may be full. So he keeps going back and forth. He's warning them. Bad things are coming. He's telling them. Great things are coming. Verse 33. These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And he has overcome the ruler of this world. The ruler of the world is death. And then, so as I said, you know, as I said before, I've come to these verses before. And what I find most amazing is how Jesus prays in verse, in chapter 17. So, you know, and so if Jesus prays, you know, he, he told us about the Lord's Prayer. That's a good one. Here he is praying, and it's another look at, okay, how can I pray? And so Jesus prays for himself. And he says in 17.1, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may also glorify you, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given. So what, what, is, what do we take away when we pray about ourselves, pray for things about ourselves? The fact of the matter is, Lord, let me glorify you. He says, he says glorify me so I can glorify you. And then he says, then, then the next section is labeled, Jesus prays for his disciples in verse 9. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And 
And he says, I do not pray in verse 15. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. In the world, you will have tribulation. Don't take them out of the world, but keep them from the evil one. He doesn't want to remove us from the hard times. He wants us to keep He wants to keep us in there so that we can show Jesus because if we are abiding in him he is abiding in us. And then one of the kind of the neatest things is verse 20 that section until chapter 18. Jesus prays for I do not pray for these alone but also those for those who will believe in me through their word. That's you and me. So beyond this, Jesus Christ, on his last, the day before he dies, he's praying for me. He knew me before time began, before I was knit in my mother's womb. He was praying for me. How cool is that? How cool is that? He prayed for you and you and you and you. He prayed for us before we were even thought of. I think that's pretty neat. And then so we get to it. And so that is the last bit of the conversation that's recorded at the Last Supper, the day before. Jesus knows what's coming. He gave them warning and he gave them promises and he gave them joy. Knowing full well, A, what the scripture said would happen to him. B, knowing what would happen. And so he goes into Gethsemane in chapter 18. And he's betrayed with a kiss. But he goes up there and he prays and he prays. You know, and you have to go to, back to Matthew and Mark to hear you know, so you go to Matthew 26 and you're at four, verse 47 or 36 and he pray, and, we, and we understand that he's praying in the garden and he asks them he just had the most intimate dinner of their lives and they didn't even realize it. And this is why the day before is so important. Because in verse 39 he says, he went a little farther, fell on his face. Jesus, the Son of God, fell on his face and prayed, Oh my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass away from me. This is the crucial moment. This is why the day before is so important. You have to make a choice in those moments, in those times when you know things are going to be so bad tomorrow. What you make the day before, the choices you make the day before are so important. And this is why it is so important. Without this next phrase that he makes, without this next choice, The rest of this book is empty. This whole book is worthless, useless, of no value and no truth. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. There he accepts the cup and he accepts the rest of the process. This was the pivotal moment when he chose. It's easy, more or less. 
you know, give me some slack and grace there. It's, it was easy for three years. He did have lots of friends and followers. He was doing God's will. Yeah, a couple people didn't like him and argued with him. But he preached the gospel. He brought the kingdom of heaven closer for three years. And the day before he's supposed to die, he knows what it's leading up to. But it's the day before and this pivotal moment when he chooses the tomorrow. He chose on the day before, he chose the tomorrow that he would face. Because if he didn't say, nevertheless, your will, things would have gone completely different. In front of Pontius Pilate, he would have renounced it all and all the high priests would have been like, well, well, we're good. I guess we're good. We're done here. He would have denied God in front of the Sanhedrin. Peter wouldn't have had to deny him because Jesus wasn't a threat. But in this pivotal moment, the day before, he chose. Without the day before, there would be no tomorrow. Without Jesus' day before the cross, we wouldn't have the cross. And so I'm, as, I'm, as I'm reading this, the Lord's like, your choices matter. And will you choose to abide in me or and I in you? Will you make those choices? Will you let your, the day before, set what happens tomorrow? But this is the promise, guys, right? So the day before, Jesus is looking at tomorrow. And he says, if I choose not to take this cup, it's going to be an okay, kind of sucky day. But he says, if I choose the cup, it's going to be awful. But we all know that it's awesome. That because he chose to take the cup, it's an awesome day for us. But if you think about it, in our, in our difficult times, right, we have to do diff- we have difficult choices. But God's promising us victory because we know that Jesus is now alive. But he's not pro- Jesus and God aren't promising that it's all going to be great right away. Because the victory part of it is that Jesus died, but he rose again. But if we're taking a look, he rose three days later. Not the day after tomorrow. Not the day after that, but the day after that. So your choice, one of those. (laughs) But if you choose, if you choose, there's, if you choose the cup, hard times may still be ahead, but the promise is that there is joy. That there is victory. He's not promising that it will always be right away. But the promise is that it will come. So the day before is so important. Yes, the cross is important. I am not downplaying the fact that Jesus died. And that that day when he was obedient and hung on the cross, that that day is not important. But what I'm saying is, without his choices the day before, knowing full well what would come, he chose obedience and the cup, and we get the result that we have today. And the promises that we have today. Because he stayed faithful. If he had not stayed faithful, every single promise that was made was is null and void. So that's the excitement. He says, there's danger, but there's joy. There's a promise that I have for you, but choose the cup. That's going to be the hardest thing. 
I mean, Jesus Christ, who could do anything, who could command legions of angels, this was the toughest choice of his life. He got on his face before the Lord. He got on his face. You know, in other parts it says, right, he, cr- he sobbed and it was t- blood. Sweat, but like the hardest choice of his life. Even hard, he didn't sweat blood when Jesus was, or when Satan was tempting him in the desert. He just recited verse with a promise and said, get away from me. This was the hardest choice of his life. Knowing full well what would happen because he read the scriptures. He knew what would have to happen. The hardest choice of his life and he chose to take it. The fact of the matter is, I don't know if I can make that choice. I would love to say, and I pray all the time, Lord, if a choice ever comes down that is hard for me to do it, let me choose your will. Let me choose your will. But that's a scary prayer to pray. Because... If I'm at that moment, I'm at the day before. And tomorrow might not be looking so great. But the fact of the matter is, the promise is still there. And it'll come. This is probably one of the most intimate looks and revelations that I've had into the heart of Jesus at this point. You know, when I... When I, when I read it and, I, and he started saying like, look at, look at this, you know, compare it to this and this and this and this. And it's almost like the anguish and the pain of what he was suffering was revealed to me even, even more than I've ever known. And I was, and I was just floored at, at the love that he would put out, you know, because the fact of the matter is, if it was down to Tyler Robertson coming to that cup, I ain't dying on that cross. I ain't going to get whipped. I ain't going to get punched. I ain't going to get slapped. I ain't going to get ridiculed. Chances are I would probably run. Well, look at Peter. Exactly. He denied Jesus three times. So the fact of the matter is, thank God he sent Jesus. (laughs) And not Tyler Robertson. Like to me, my heart just wants to cry out. And, and, and I, don't, I don't even have enough thanks or words to properly put into place just the, the pain and, and the, the, the happiness and the joy that he chose to do it for me versus having to let somebody else do it. So, let's worship.